the microphone won't hear anything. Uh, neither will you. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Adrian Bowyer. Um, I used to be an academic at the University of Bath, where Jeremy was also, in fact, an academic. Um, uh, uh, but I'm now retired, uh, though I do run my own small consultancy company in, in 3D printing. Um, the reason uh, the organizers of this asked me to come here today is that I started something that's already been mentioned this evening, the, the RepRap project. Um, uh, but I'm not actually going to speak, uh, unlike the way Bracken did, about the technicalities of 3D printing. I'm going to talk more about some possible implications of one of its characteristics. Um, and as you can see, I've given, given the talk a bit of a, a Warhol-ish title. Uh, in the future, everyone will work for 15 minutes. Um, you can't go to a news website uh, or to uh, any sort of publication these days without people talking about the impact of uh, robotics and AI on employment. And in particular, uh, we're told that uh, technologies in general tend to, tend to monopoly. Um, and of course, the fact that the internet allows some sorts of technologies to scale very, very fast certainly enhances that effect. Um, uh, Facebook has a virtual monopoly in its area of, of uh, the social media. Uh, Google has a virtual monopoly on um, search. Amazon well, doesn't quite have a monopoly on shopping, but sometimes it seems that way. Um, so, uh, so that's what technologies tend to do. And uh, this is considered by many, uh, me included, to be a bad thing. Um, technologies also t tend to automate away unreliable and expensive human beings, hence the little cartoon at the top. Um, Toyota, uh, it's a company I'll mention again in a minute, very big company, of course, um, don't employ nearly as many human beings as a motor company would to make as many motor cars 50 years ago. And the reason for that is because the making of motor cars has been largely automated. Um, Intel make all the, not all the chips we use, make a lot of the chips we use. Again, as you all know, the manufacture of electronics is a highly, highly automated process involving comparatively few human beings. Um, and because few people are involved, and these things tend to monopoly, it tends to concentrate wealth and in increase inequality. Uh, I mentioned Amazon, Jeff Bezos, who founded Amazon, is the richest person on earth. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg is not short of a dollar or two. Um, and so on. Uh, now, as I say, this is an argument that you hear all the time, and I re rehearsed it here again quickly uh, because uh, I wanted to point out a couple of things about it. Uh, I said at the bottom, this is a bit true, uh, which it is, except for, well, uh, the first thing is, as you'll be able to see by looking at me, is that I'm horribly old. So, in fact, I've heard this argument three times in my life. Um, the first time was when I was a child growing up in the 60s, in the late 50s and early 60s, um, and mainframe computers were beginning to um, become widely used in business and academia and militarily and so on. And everybody was saying exactly this um, at the time. And then some uh, 20, 25 years later, when the microcomputer was introduced, exactly the same points were made again. And now here we are again some 30 years after that. Um, so, this idea that technology is going to create these possibly unwanted effects is something that happens in a continuous cycle. Anyway, if we talk about creating monopolies and very large companies and the way they tend to concentrate wealth, uh, let, let's look at some of those big companies. Um, according to Forbes magazine, uh, here are some of the world's biggest companies. Well, the world's very biggest company is the International Bank of China. Um, and you have to go into exponential notation to start talking about the amounts of money involved here. Uh, the International Bank of China has 3.3 times 10 to the 12 dollars in assets. Um, and if you go down the Forbes list, uh, the first six, until we get to number seven, the first six companies in that list just do one thing. All they do is they make sure that when they subtract one number from another, they then add that number onto some other number somewhere else. That's their entire function. That's, that's all that banks do, of course. Um, so, um, and the top six companies in the world uh, are entirely concerned with that. The first company that actually does anything with stuff uh, is ExxonMobil, number seven, 3.5 times 10 to the $11 market capitalization. Market capitalization and assets aren't quite the same thing. Uh, it's too dull and boring to go into, but if you want to know afterwards, I'll tell you. 
Um, then we go down the list to the first manufacturing company in the list, which is Toyota, which I just mentioned, uh, 2.4 times 10 to the 11 dollars. And then Apple, which is sometimes called the world's biggest company, it does have the world's biggest market capitalization, but in terms of actual size, it's number 12, uh, 7.4 times 10 to the 11 dollars. So that's a whole load of really big companies in which lots of money has been concentrated. Um, but the world's biggest industry doesn't feature anywhere in that top of that list. Unsurprisingly, when you learn about it, the world's biggest industry, again, called, according to Forbes, is farming, or food in general. Eight billion human beings on Earth, we all need meals. Uh, it's an extremely good thing that there are fewer people going in hunger today than there have been in the virtually any time in recorded history, so farming is working. Um, but this prompts an extremely important question, which, to be perfectly honest with you all, I've never seen much posed anywhere else, but I'm going to pose it to you this evening. It's why, given that food is the world's biggest industry, are there no food and farming industries among the world's biggest companies? You'd expect the biggest economic activity on Earth to be the one where there were the biggest companies, wouldn't you? Not true, not the case. Well, okay, farming is making food. Those other companies, Toyota, for example, make manufactured goods. Uh, some of them, some of them, as I say, just subtract and add numbers, but so it goes in the nature of finance. Um, let's look at a pie chart of global annual manufacturing output. This is stuff made on Earth, um, and it looks as if it's all one color, the, the blue disk of the pie chart here, except there's, those in the front can at least see, there's a tiny little orange sliver in the middle here. Um, and this is two types of manufacturing, which I, I'll explain what P and DP are in a minute. Um, P is the big one, uh, that's 5 times 10 to the 12 metric tons per annum, uh, which is a lot. Um, and you should take that figure with a very large pinch of salt, because I did considerable research on this to try and find out what it should be, and nowhere does it seem to be published. Um, so that's the result of me doing a back-of-an-envelope calculation to try and figure out how many tons were manufactured. If you look at manufacturing and ask what the global manufacturing output of the world in dollars is, you'll find endless publications telling you about dollars, but nothing actually useful and physical that you can weigh. Um, so anyway, that's P. EP, this little thing down the bottom, is about a thousand times smaller, the little orange. What are those two things? Well, they're these. Um, P stands for phenotype. And this is things growing. Uh, it's all the natural world making stuff. Uh, and, well, you can see bits of the natural world there. Uh, I stole that elephant and giraffe picture from a creationist website. I thought I might as well put it to some use. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and, and also, the, the little e electron microscope picture in the background, bacteria, archaea, and so on, uh, you might think that, in fact, that's the biggest contribution to the mass. Uh, surprisingly, not so. Uh, nor, indeed, is the biggest contribution to the mass in the oceans. It's actually trees growing on land is the biggest single contributor to that, that very large amount of manufacture. Um, the other type of manufacture, the little orange sliver, is what I've called extended phenotype manufacturing. <coughs> uh, extended phenotype is an idea originally uh, uh, generated by Richard Dawkins. Uh, it's the idea that living organisms not only grow and have blue eyes and, in my case, gray hair, um, but they also make things around them in addition to making things uh, that are part of themselves, like their own livers. Um, so, for example, birds make birds' nests, as we're all familiar with. Ants make ant nests. And human beings make, well, the chairs you're sitting on, or motor cars, or whatever. Um, human beings, of course, have the largest extended phenotype of any species. So extended phenotype manufacturing is basically self-replicating machines, which is all living organisms. Uh, some of those self-replicating machines, mainly animals, though there are a few plants and other things that do it as well, mainly animals, uh, making stuff from things they find lying about. So birds make nests from twigs and leaves and so on, and human beings make cars from, well, dirt, basically, um, which we dig up and subject to certain processes in order to get to the point where we can drive from A to B. And from this, and from that really unequal pie chart, we can see that self-replication allows vast wealth production. 
compared to extended phenotype production. The living world manufactures an unimaginably larger quantity of stuff as time goes on than human beings making things, or indeed birds making things. Um, that's a little sort of diagram of cell dividing there. And this, I contend, is the reason for that strange phenomenon that I pointed out a few minutes ago. Why is the food and farming industry not featuring in the world's largest companies? It's because uniquely amongst all human manufacturing, food is self-replicating. Everything you eat is a product of self-replication. The things you eat are cells. And as a consequence, because self-replication is so productive, it allows anybody to get involved at a small scale. An ear of wheat, though it's incredibly more complicated than a motor car, costs essentially nothing. If you've got an ear of wheat, you plant it in a square meter, a year later you'll have thousands of ears of wheat, and a few years later you'll have a field full. Assuming you've got a field to put it in. But the capital investment required to get involved in making food for other people or for yourself is tiny compared with the capital investment required to start making motor cars. And that tends to keep production distributed in comparatively small units. Of course, there are quite big industrial companies that are involved in food, uh, seed companies like Monsanto and so on, but, but they don't feature near the top of that list that I showed you before. So, this prompts an obvious question. How can we transfer the power of self-replication from farming into engineering? And if we do that, what will that mean for the industries that we currently have? And I made a small contribution to this. Um, and it's already been mentioned today by Bracken, the, the RepRap. Uh, RepRap is short for Replicating Rapid Prototyper. And this is a project that I started in 2004, 2005. Um, I wanted to make a useful self-replicating manufacturing machine and um, I wasn't particularly concerned with which technology is used to do it but when I th thought about it and as a consequence of my universities acquiring some conventional 3D printers I realized that 3D printing of all the human manufacturing technologies stood the best chance of being able to make a copy a machine that copied itself. Uh, this is one rep wrap machine. It happens to be a design of mine called Lorentz. As you can see, it's one of the Delta machines, again, that Bracken described in his talk. Um, uh, it's still under development. I'm still working on the design of this. Uh, and it's one of the things about all rep wraps is that they're fully open source. They're distributed under the GPL. Uh, the reason for that is twofold. When I first had the idea of a self-replicating manufacturing machine, I thought that that might be quite a disruptive thing. And one of the things about dis disrupted technology, and this is back to wealth co concentration again, is that um, if you, uh, for example, try and patent your machine or copyright it or whatever you might do, then uh, what you're saying is that only a small number of people are going to have access to it and everybody else is going to pay for it. Now, of course, I'd be in that small number. Hooray. Uh, but um, <laughs> nonetheless, that seemed to me potentially a little bit unfair. And then after I'd had that perhaps uncharacteristically noble thought, uh, and decided to open source the, the self-replicating 3D printer, uh, I realized that you've got to open source a self-replicating manufacturing machine. If you try to patent a self-replicating machine, what you're saying to the world is, um, here's my idea, you're not allowed to do the one thing with it that it was intended to do, and if you do, I'll take you to court. Now, I've got better things to do with my time. Um, so uh, that's the second and perhaps more important powerful reason why I open sourced it. So there are now hundreds of designs for these machines available online. Uh, you can manufacture one using virtually any 3D printer, of course including themselves. Um, uh, and you need to add extra bits in from outside. Um, in the case of this one, everything you can see there that's white, including the thing it just printed, which is actually one of the blocks that sits at the bottom there. Everything you can see there that's white is made in the machine itself, uh, which is not all of it. Uh, in fact, uh, this one makes about 65% of itself. Uh, but all rep wrap designs are put together in such a way that the other bits that you need are very widely available for not horrendous amounts of expensive money. Um, so you can buy the parts for them anywhere in the world. Uh, you can print the bits that are special to the machine, 
put the whole lot together and you've got another machine. Um, this 65% figure, incidentally, uh, you might think, well, it'd be nice to get that bigger. Um, remember that you only build 60% of yourself. Um, you might think that you built yourself right from that single cell in your mother's uterus and that you did it all yourself. Well, not quite, really. Uh, you bought parts in from outside. Um, the th things that your genes code to make are proteins. Proteins are made of amino acids. There are 20 of them. Uh, and you can make 12. The other eight you have to bring in from outside. So you make 60% of yourself and the other 40% you have to get from the food you eat. Anyway, obviously, back to farming and food again, any one of the plant can grow a seed for a friend. And of course, anyone with a rep rap machine can make another rep rap for a friend. Uh, there is the very first rep rap machine on the left with me. Uh, and that is the parent machine of the child machine on the right. The, child, the bits that were 3D printed in the machine on the right were printed by the machine on the left. And the other bloke there is Vic Oliver, who's a New Zealander, who's been involved in the project from the very beginning. And almost exactly 10 years ago, just uh, 10 years and a month or so ago, uh, was the very first replication where we put together the machine on the right of the screen there. Uh, and we, uh, having carefully printed it in the machine on the left, which, of course, we made with a conventional 3D printer, not designed to self-replicate. And um, when we got the child machine all together, we turned it on, and it didn't work. <laughs> but the reason it didn't work was because we'd been very stupid. Uh, it's got a tooth belt, uh, which, again, has been mentioned earlier, uh, and we cut it too long, uh, which is stupid, as I say. We discovered that if we just held a screwdriver against that tooth belt, the machine worked fine, which was good because then we immediately sat down, we designed a belt tensioner, we held the screwdriver against the belt for 20 minutes while the belt tensioner was printed in the child machine, so the child machine made its first grandchild part, which we fitted to it, and then it worked fine from then on. And this illustrates another thing, which is if you've got a self-replicating machine, self-repair sort of comes free. In particular, if you've got two of them and one breaks, one can always repair the other. Okay, let's go back to it. Econo uh, economics again for a moment. Uh, anybody who studied economics for more than 10 minutes learns about the idea of economies of scale and the idea that you can make things more cheaply if you scale production up. So on our left, we have a traditional blacksmith's forge, uh, making horseshoes by the look of it. But of course, every village would have someone whose responsibility it was uh, to make gate hinges and horseshoes and bolts for barns and all that sort of thing. Uh, on the right is a factory which is essentially intended to do just the same thing. It's a 19th century iron foundry. Um, and of course, that can make hinges much more cheaply than the blacksmith because people can specialize when you've got economies of scale. You can have one person who's responsible for the design of the hinges, another person who's responsible for keeping the furnaces fired up and so on. Um, and that allows the objects that have been manufactured to be manufactured much more cheaply. Something that's not mentioned when this is taught in economics classes often is the fact that this goes into reverse when technology gets cheap and simple enough. Cheap and simple technology reverses economies of scale. So, on our left here, we've got a 19th century laundry. Um, hands up everybody who sends their clothes to the laundry like their grandparents did. None of you do, because we've all got a robot in our kitchens that does our laundry for us. Now, that robot has a number of interesting characters. Well, the most interesting thing about it is that it washes our clothes, which is useful, so we don't go around too smelly all the time. But um, the other thing it does is nothing most of the time. We're quite happy to spend 400 quid on that robot and have it sit in our kitchen for 95% of the time doing absolutely damn all doesn't matter that we spent that money on it. We're quite happy for the f convenience of that 5% of the time when it's washing our clothes. doesn't bother us at all. Also, it makes the cleaning of our clothes much more robust. If the water supply for the town laundry fails, everybody's clothes stay dirty. If the water supply, or indeed some mechanical part of our washing room robot, fails, then we just knock on our neighbor's door and say, would you mind awfully if we just washed our clothes until the person comes to mend the machine? Assuming they're friendly, they'll say yes. Um, 
Another thing that's going this way um, is power the power to run all the electricity in here is being generated by something like this, almost certainly. That's a two gigawatt power station. Um, but increasingly, and I'm one of these people, uh, people have their own power station sitting on their roofs. Um, and it's now the case that the two cheapest forms of energy that you can get are solar and wind. Uh, and the only reason why they've not completely taken over is the storage problem. Uh, so this is another example of this e reversal of economies of scale. When the technology gets cheap enough and convenient enough, we distribute it around the place. And of course, in principle, uh, this is a much more robust solution than this. If this fails, a whole county goes dark. Assuming you're powering your own home with batteries and solar cells, uh, if yours fail, only your house goes dark. So let's look at the convenience and robustness of distribution. Um, pretty much everybody in the developed world today has their own CD pressing plant. Um, they've got their own photographic laboratory. Uh, and they've got their own printing press. Uh, and of course, they don't look like these traditional versions of those things. They look like the object that I'm using to give you this talk in front of me, uh, because that's taken over those functions. And these are other functions that used to be industrial. Does everybody remember those yellow envelopes that you used to put rolls of film in and send them away, and you know your prints would come back a week later? No, not anymore. No point. You can get them instantly. And Similarly, if you want party invitations, I can remember my parents going to the printer in town and ordering headed notepaper from the printer and a ream of headed notepaper. This is, I think, even the days before A-size a paper. So a ream of full scat notepaper uh, came back with our address printed nicely on the top. And we used to write thank you letters to our aunts and uncles at Christmas on this stuff. Dear Auntie Margaret, thank you for your wonderful present which, of course, means that you've forgotten what it was already, um, uh, and so on. And printed headed note paper was a thing. Nobody, of course, does that. You just have a file on your computer which you stick the text of your letter in, assuming you want to send one using pieces of paper at all. Um, so if we're going to do this, if everybody's going to uh, take all of these pieces of technology back to themselves from the economies of scale, because it's so cheap and so simple, uh, why shouldn't people run their own factory to make their own stuff? And if you're interested, and we'll see the link to the Rep Rep website in a little while, um, uh, there are papers on there which show that, in fact, it's economic for an average family in the developed world to own a 3D printer already because of the amount of money it saves on printing cat flaps and spare bits for lavatory systems and all that sort of thing that you can do. It, like the washing machine, just 5% of the time. And if we're going to have everybody having their own factory, let's make it like agriculture, where anybody who has a seed can grow a plant and then give the friend a seed for the same plant. Uh, let's make it a factory that makes more factories. That way, if you've got one, you can make one and give it to her, and, or possibly sell it to her for the cost of the parts. Uh, the very first rep wrap changed hands from the person who made it to his friend uh, for the price of a crate of beer. This makes me a happy person. And, of course, as I've already hypothesized, and it is only a hypothesis, hypothesis uh, when I was talking about the nature of self-replication and the unique characteristics that food has that it's entirely self-replicating, Self-replication is inherently distributive, just like food production, and it works against concentration, uniquely amongst all technologies. And so, if we go down this route to production, and I'm not saying that we're going to be making super tankers using machines like the one illustrated on the right anytime soon, but if we go down this route to production and expand upon it, then uh, it seems to me that that might well take us away from this difficulty that we have with most technologies causing the concentration of wealth, increase of inequality, and also uh, the growth of monopolies. Uh, all of those are militated against by things that copy themselves. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much indeed.
if you point your phone at that, it'll take you to the RepRap website. Andy, first question. This is a robot. What, um, <laughs> what cultural changes do we have to make so that it's all right for people to not work and enjoy their lives and sit on the beach or whatever it is they want to do? Well, I'm a great, uh, this is not really part of my talk, but just speaking personally, uh, I'm a great advocate of the idea of universal basic income. Um, so if you look at the, well, let, let me give an example of how that would work. Um, suppose we were to take the following. We take pensions, we take the minimum wage and we take what is effectively unemployment benefit, though of course it's all rolled into one these days for all the benefits, but let's take unemployment benefit, the minimum wage and pensions and, and cause them to converge, okay? Then you tax every company by the minimum wage and say, yeah, go ahead and pay your staff more than that, but that's the minimum wage is going to go to everybody, every adult in the country. Now, you can do that, you can see, assuming the three things that I mentioned converge, you can do that uh, without any change in the balance of money at all, really. The company is paying the same money out that they would have been paying originally because the minimum wage and the, is subtracted from the salaries they have to pay their employees. Uh, those employees get that minimum wage as the universal basic income. Pensioners get it as well, and so do people who are unemployed. So that's how to start. But of course, You've then got the problem that was illustrated by me and has been mentioned by others, which is that as companies progress, they've got an enormous incentive to get rid of human beings and entirely to automate their workflow. So if you've got this enormous company making billions of dollars that employs three people, sure, they don't, the company then pays that three minimum wages to the government, but nothing much goes back into the general economy. So, what you need then is a system of progressive taxation which essentially taxes companies by corporation tax at a rate proportional to their total profits divided by the number of employees. In other words, companies with lots of employees don't pay much tax. Companies with very few employees and large profits pay a lot of tax. Anyway, rant over, that's how I'd solve the problem. <laughs> Yep. Um, what do you think is stopping it, if anything, from being in everyone's house today? Well, okay, this is a highly computer literate organ, audience. Let's, let's just try and hands up everybody who's got their own conventional computer printer at home. About 80% of people, but not everybody. You've all got computers, I'm presuming that. Well, at least you've all got a phone, which is a sort of computer. Uh, so not everybody has a paper printer. And I think not everybody's going to have one of these things either. Though there'll come a point where they're so easy to use that people are happy to have them sitting like the washing machine doing nothing and just occasionally print something. Oh, fancy one of them. Print. Come back in the morning and there it is. Um, but one of the things that you can do, of course, quite easily with 3D printing is to make large objects by making small things and sticking them together. Uh, because it's very easy to chop three-dimensional designs up and print bits of them on one thing and bits of them on the other. People have already started to 3D print electric cars. There are companies that are set up to do precisely that. So I can foresee a time when you've got a village of people, for example, 60 people or whatever, maybe seven or eight of whom have got their own printers, and rather like the blacksmith, but entirely automated so that people don't have to slave in a hot workshop every day. Uh, if your friend just up the road emails you a thing and says, could you just print this out for me? You say, yeah, give me five quid and I'll print it or whatever. And um, you could see it working like that, including up to the village printing a car maybe for one of the residents. Who knows? I don't know. It's not given to me to, uh, to, or to any of us to see the future. Uh, a lot of these things really get here or, you know, from anywhere that yes, it's true. China. Yes, uh, and uh, it, it's true, of course, that the, the more remote a place you're in, the more difficult it is to obtain anything, uh, regardless of what it is. Um, but there is a certain amount of evidence, though admittedly it's a bit thin, that 
the same thing is happening with 3D printers in developing companies in terms of leapfrogging certain bits of technology as has happened to the mobile phone. As I'm sure you're aware, lots of developing countries have completely overstepped the point where the vast majority of the population had copper wire running into their homes for phone calls. And everybody, of course, uses these. Um, and there's a certain amount of evidence that in some developing countries, um, for example, the, the Palestinian territories in the Middle East, uh, that people are using 3D printers uh, in order to circumvent constraints that they find on their conventional manufacturing activity. You can imagine that it's quite difficult to set up a conventional manufacturing plant in the Gaza Strip. Uh, but on the other hand, doing this sort of thing, not quite so tricky. And in fact, there was a famous news story a few weeks ago about someone who'd been um, 3D printing uh, medical devices in the Gaza Strip for use because, of course, the sanctions that they are subjected to makes it very difficult for them to obtain such things. So, yeah. <laughs>